the two things that stood out to me, because it does show the smugness, they couldn't have cared less about how these policies were actually going to affect people, were um, forcing the people who came into the UK, who came back home to the UK into hotels, and how they were laughing. The permanent secretary at 10 Downing, uh, talking with Man Han- uh, Hancock, the, the health secretary, who you were, that, that's, that's the guy who, from who you got the WhatsApp messages. Hancock says, we're giving big families uh, all the sweets and putting pop stars in the box rooms. And Simon Case, permanent secretary at Downing Street, says, I just want to see some of the faces of people coming out of first class and into a premiere in shoebox. Any idea how many people we locked up in hotels yesterday? Hancock says, none, but 149 chose to enter the country and are now in quarantine hotels due to their own free will. Simon Case, hilarious. And here's the worst one for me, Isabel, because this, this gets into my my worst issue. Face masks. Boris mm-hmm. Johnson. I mean, a lot of people over here think, okay, he's conservative. Oh, great. We like it. No, Boris Johnson. This is shameful what he did. He put those face masks, masks on those kids in school, even though he knew that there was no data to support the health effects of it. Tell us why. Well, I I agree with you about face masks. That really gets me too. And what we learn from these messages is that one of the reasons that that policy of continuing to enforce face masks on children here in the UK was extended was because the government of England did not want to fall out with the government of Scotland. Uh, And there's a lot of kind of Petty politics here, really. Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland, was always trying to be one step ahead of Westminster, was always trying to uh, promote her agenda of separation for Scotland by showing just how uh, how tough she was. And she is a very formidable and very effective politician. And frankly, I think Downing Street was pretty afraid of how well she was doing. The Scots were lapping it up in large part. They were as terrified as people were down here in England by the fear propaganda. And Downing Street chose essentially when Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland said she was going to make children wear masks, Downing Street didn't really fancy picking a fight with her. And I wanna pick up on that exchange uh, between the top civil servant in Downing Street, who's supposed to be apolitical by the way, and the health secretary about the quarantine policy and how funny they found it. And I think what these WhatsApps show is a lot about power. This is a story of what happens when a very small number of people acquire, in fact, basically seize an enormous amount of power to control extraordinary detail of our everyday lives and how entrenched they become and how messianic they become about yeah. the agenda they've decided is the right one. And I'm sure that they they absolutely felt that they were somehow doing the right thing. But I think they got carried away by their own heroic roles in this crusade. Mm. To me, what was so jarring was just how little they actually cared about how it was going to affect people from the nursing care homes to this the masking issue. And as the mother of three kids, that that one hurt personally. And this is an exchange, this Lee Kane, the prime minister's director of communications is talking with Boris Johnson, writing with him about whether they should have masks in schools and extend that policy. And Lee Kane writes, um, considering Scotland has just confirmed it will, I find it hard to believe will hold the line. Um, and then he goes on to say, also, why do we want to have the fight on not having masks in certain school settings? Does he have kids? Does he ask any parent with children on why you want to have that fight? There are so many good reasons he couldn't care less and thousands of children wound up with his hand effectively over their mouths because he didn't have the will to fight. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I'm the mother of three children myself, three youngish children. And the impact of the pandemic on children is one of the things I feel most strongly about. Here in the UK, schools were repeatedly closed down on the flimsiest of bases. We know now, we knew pretty early on that this virus did not present a very serious risk at all to the vast majority of children. And yet they were shut out of schools And here in the UK, tens of thousands of children have never returned to education. 
And the impact of those restrictions continues to affect families so profoundly. And one of the uh, the lovely things about uh, this expose, because I have taken many brick bats, has been the number of people writing to me, ordinary people, widows, parents, elderly people who suffered loneliness and so on. And the letters that move me the most are those of the mothers. And I received one letter um, from a a contact from a lady, a single mother living in very, very tough circumstance, very poor family uh, in a inner city area in the north. And she described how she found herself stuck in very inadequate accommodation with two children, a five-year-old with attention deficit disorder, so a very hyperactive five-year-old, and a teenage boy. And the five-year-old, uh, they, they don't have their own garden in that property. And the place he really needed to go to let off steam was the local play park. That was closed off by these crazy zealots in the local authority. And she found she had nowhere to take her little boy to run off his energy. So she decided mm. to move house, seeing that probably there were going to be more lockdowns. And they moved to a different part of England where she found she was unable to get a school place for her teenage son, who was then 14 or 15. And by this stage in this country, so-called home education, online learning, had become such an easy default for the government, where the government couldn't be bothered to look after people properly. It just, oh, well, you can do it all online. And this teenage boy became increasingly isolated. He wasn't playing sport anymore. He piled on weight. He became obese. He got more and more lonely and paranoid about all the propaganda of more variants coming. And the fear just took over him to the point that he wouldn't even open his bedroom window because he thought the virus was going to come and get him. And eventually, three days before Christmas, he told his mother that he was going out to buy some groceries and that child never came home. He went oh, no. to the woods and he hung himself. No. Isn't that just the most damning indictment on this reckless policy? He was just a statistic that our government did not care about. They only cared about compliance statistics, not the children like that of parents who had no agency and who suffered every additional day of unnecessary lockdown. Oh my God, that in a just world, that story would be on the front of every newspaper covering your reporting right next to that, that official's quote, why do we want the fight? Why, why do we want the fight? That's why. I mean, I get it. I get it. The way we came to see all this information is controversial, but it's just, that's not the story. That is that is a footnote to the story. What you just said is the story, and any honest media would be covering it accordingly. It's been infuriating to watch them try to get you. I've seen it. I mean, that, I, I wasn't familiar with your work before, but I've been become very familiar, and I've become a fan, watching you argue with these people who are trying to, like, get you for having reported the thing. It's like, why aren't you, why don't they want to know about this boy? Why aren't they concerned about what their government did to them? The story is not me. And actually, the story isn't Matt Hancock as an individual. The story is the collateral damage. And it is as much about what is not in these WhatsApps as what is in them. So I don't see anywhere in 2.3 million words of messages, I don't see anywhere the key people asking what might be the collateral damage here? What is the balance of damage and risk here? What will be the impact on people, on millions of people, if we basically turn our health service here into a COVID service? Question. What's the secret to great skincare? Here's Mary and her husband from Faith, North Carolina, with the answer. She writes, quote, my husband and I both noticed that our skin is softer and smoother after using GenuCell products faithfully. Our skin looks brighter, our wrinkles look softer and less noticeable, and the bags under my eyes are less visible, so happy. Best of all, they're easy to use and apply even for my husband, end quote. GenuCell's most popular package, that's all their best stuff, has everything 
for all of your skincare needs. Wrinkles, dark spots, skin redness, redness, sagging jawline, dark circles, even annoying bags and puffiness under your eyes. And with its immediate effects product, you will see results in 12 hours or less, guaranteed, or you'll get your money back. Stop waiting. Try GenuCell's most popular package for 70% off at GenuCell.com. And for a limited time, their new probiotic extract moisturizer is included for visibly clearer and younger looking skin. Free. Go to GenuCell.com slash MK60. GenuCell.com slash MK60. And for a limited time, any subscription order includes a free beauty box and free concierge shipping. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash MK60. That's genucel.com slash MK60. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.